So very good morning to you, Freedom Church. Janine was right when she said today is slightly different. You're going to definitely need your Bible. So if you haven't got it yet, just push pause and, and get up and get it from the coffee table or where it's lying next to your bed. And open it up to Luke chapter 1. Keep your finger in there because we're going to be jumping around through God's Word this morning. I asked my mates sitting here tonight, I said, who can remember the, the three points that we spoke about last week? Uh, my wife yawned and she gave half of the first one. So good for you, Fox. You, you, you in the, my, in, yeah, you, you're, going, you're good tonight, babe. But the, a couple of other guys couldn't remember. And so I'm trying to ask Jesus to use me to change the world one person at a time. And I don't quite see it happening here with my mates. But in any case, next week we'll hire a rent a crowd. And we'll get some new people in here. And maybe they can come to the party. But seriously, if you want to be part of these incredible Thursday nights, let us know through social media. It's been amazing. We've been getting together with these recordings, having a meal, praying together, enjoying the worship with the band. And so you're saying, oh, but what about church? We don't know just yet what's happening. Keep watching social media and uh, keep praying with us as God leads us in the future for Freedom Church. Anyway, we spoke about those three points last week. God's word is alive. We can trust and we can believe God's word. Why? For three reasons. Because of oral tradition, our witness accounts, that was the second point. And the third point from last week, because of what was written in the documents. Friends, we can believe that the Bible is real and alive for us at a time like this. And so today we're going to look at just one more point as to why we can believe that the Bible is real. And why we can believe that we can trust the Bible. And so the fourth reason today why we can believe and trust in the Bible is this word, prophecy. We're going to spend some time looking at that. So get your Bibles open to Luke chapter 1. I forgot mine. I borrowed my friend's wife's Bible. It's feminine, but it's lacquer. I've got my notes here. Let's look at it from Luke chapter 1. This is what it says. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were our witnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke wrote his gospel for this man called Theophilus. He's got a title, he's probably a noble man. Some commentators say that Dr. Luke was a very scientific man, very clever man. Very detailed man. Some, some theologists say that, that, that uh, Dr. Luke was hired by, he was paid by Theophilus to write an account of the things of Jesus. So the question that we ask ourselves is how are you going to use your skills? Because Dr. Luke's this incredibly clever, gifted man. He used his skills for Jesus. Theophilus, perhaps a wealthy man, he used his skills, his, his wealth, his gifts for Jesus. How are you and I this week, this month, how are we going to use our skills and our time and our gifts for Jesus? There's a lady here who shared with us earlier about her colleague who's got MS and how she sits at the office. And how she asks God to use her and to just play a role in, in being Jesus to this lady. In this lady, her colleague's time of need. Some of us have got brains, like my friend's wife, she's gifted. Some of my friends are gifted with money. Maybe you're gifted with both. How are we going to use our time and our money and our resources to play a role for Jesus? Because we've been gifted with certain things. And we have the opportunity to tell people about Jesus as we go through life together. Luke's writing an account of the things of Jesus for this man, Theophilus. Some other commentators say this about Theophilus, that they, they say perhaps he was Paul's lawyer and, and that he wrote a letter to Luke and said, please, can you tell me about the accounts and the things of Jesus so that I can defend the church, so that I can defend Paul as he sits in jail in Rome. So whether Theophilus was a new believer who wanted an account of, of Jesus or whether he was a clever lawyer, you can read Luke in many different ways. You can you read and use Luke either to strengthen your faith or you can read Luke to defend your faith. The, the book of Luke is written in both of those ways. Let's carry on reading. In the time of Herod, 
king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. And so an angel appears to Zechariah. This oak is so scared. He's shaking in his boots. The angel says, hey, Zechariah, don't be scared, buddy. Don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, she's going to bear a son. You must call him John. He will be a joy. And a delight to you. But this guy, Zechariah, doubts what the angel is saying. And he says, how can I believe what you're saying? And, and so the angel says to him, you're doubting, hey, Zechariah. Just to prove that I'm right, Zechariah, you're not going to be able to speak from this very moment until your wife gives birth to John. Shh, no talking, Zechariah. You can't talk until your son is born. And so Elizabeth does fall pregnant. Let's jump to verse 25 there. Read it with me. Elizabeth acknowledges that she's pregnant and she says, the Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown his favor and he has taken away my disgrace among the people. Say disgrace. God takes away our disgrace. That's the first thing that we can pick up here in chapter one, friends. God takes away the disgrace. He takes away the dis. He takes away the dis of, of everything in your life. Your disgrace, your disillusionment, you've been disqualified. He takes away the dis and he leaves the other parts. For you, So everybody who is going to walk onto that piece of land that God's given us when we finally one day put the tent up, when they come into that space, everyone who's disqualified, he takes away the dis and they walk off that land qualified. Everyone who walks into that tent on that land one day who comes in disillusioned, he takes away the dis and you walk away illusioned. If you walk into church disgraced, he takes away the dis, you walk out with grace. That's what Jesus does. Amen? Let's carry on reading. Verse 26. Six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sends Gabriel the angel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name, yes, we know, was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Gabriel, the angel, tells Mary that she's going to conceive a child and she's to call this boy Jesus. She says to Gabriel, it's not possible. There's no ways because I'm a virgin. Jump to verse 35. See what it says. The angel answers Mary and says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is already in her sixth month. For nothing, see it in your Bible? For nothing is impossible with God. Underline that and say it with me. Nothing is impossible with God. But I want us to say it loudly. Say it loudly with me so the neighbors can hear outside your babes. Nothing is impossible with God. Let's say it again. Nothing is impossible with God. Brilliant. And so in this story, you've got two wombs of two different women. You've got a womb of a woman that has been married to a man for many, many, many years, probably 40, maybe 50 years, Elizabeth and Zechariah. And through their life together as husband and, and wife, th those days there was no contraception. And so in the course of that married life, that womb would have received much sperm many, many, many times in their marriage. Then you've got the womb of another woman. That womb has never been touched by any sperm. And that woman gets in, that womb gets impregnated. And the comment there is nothing, nothing is impossible with God. In the book of 1 John chapter 3, it talks about the word of God being sperma. The Greek there, seed, exactly the same word. As sperm, the thing that impregnates you. And so whether you've been sitting in the church for 20 or 30 years and you've grown up in church all your life 
and you've read the word of God, but it hasn't impregnated your heart, or maybe today you're listening to the word of God for the very first time in your lounge, or you're listening to it while you're driving to work, nothing, nothing is impossible. For God, He can impregnate your heart with His sperma, and Christ can be birthed inside of you, friends. And you can start living life to the full, the way that God intended us to live life. For nothing is impossible for God. And so we want to build a church where nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible for God. I believe that the church is a womb. And that whoever sits in church, if we preach the Bible properly, and if we worship Jesus properly, just like we've been worshiping him tonight with a band, and if we glorify God, the impregnation of Jesus will take place inside of our hearts, and something will grow inside of our heart that will give birth to Christ so that we can live life to the full. And you might have put a contraceptive over your heart. You might be sitting with unforgiveness in your heart. And so you read the word of God, you read the Bible, but you don't change. I pray that you would remove that contraceptive from your heart so that the sperma, God's living word, the seed through the word can penetrate your heart and impregnate you for Christ. Amen. The fourth reason we can believe the Bible, friends, is because of prophecy. Luke chapter 1, read with me verse 16. It says, John the Baptist, this oak, is going to bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. And the disobedience to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. If you read the last book of the Bible, written by the prophet Malachi, those are the exact words that he prophesied 400 years before the book of Luke was written. Friends, we can trust the Bible. And if you think that that was coincidence, then go to Isaiah chapter 40. The prophet Isaiah, he wrote the the book of Isaiah 700 years before the book of Luke was written. We can trust the Bible because of all of these things that line up in God's word. And, and one of the reasons that, that cults uh, of today have not been, been able to, people can't trust the cults of today. Why not? Because people that have said things about when Jesus Christ is coming back, uh, the, the, their promises and, and, and um, ideas about Jesus coming back, friends, they haven't come true. We see people stockpiling on tuna and two-ply boiler paper. That, that stuff, why? Because we, we can't trust what, those, what, those, what people and, and false prophets have saying. But the Bible, the New Testament, has fulfilled over 700 prophecies from the Old Testament. And that's one of the reasons that we can trust the Bible. So let's have a couple uh, couple more examples of prophecy that we can look at tonight. Isaiah chapter 9. Don't worry to turn there. I'll read it for you. This is what it says in Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. When you listen to those verses that I've just read to you, what does that remind you of? Those verses. Remember, we were on the school field in December, Christmas Day. We shared around that, friends. We read that together from Luke chapter 1. That was prophesied already in Isaiah 700 years ago. Friends, we've got to study the Bible. We've got to look at the Bible. I look at a group of people sitting in front of me tonight. They've got their Bibles open. I look at a young girl. She walked in tonight with her Bible under her arm and she had the books of the Bible. She had notes sticking out. I thought, wow, this young girl, just 14 years old, allowing the Bible to become alive to her as she studies the Bible. Revival can only take place when the word of God and the spirit of God impregnates our hearts. Let's have a look at another example of prophecy in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 11. 
This is what it says. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing new fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And then Isaiah 42 says this. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. And so there it is, 700 years before, now it gets fulfilled. 700 years later, in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, find it there in your Bible. If you got it there, Ruan, check it out there. But this is what it says. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And this is what was prophesied from Isaiah. Now it's happening. As he was praying, heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son. 700 years before, now it's becoming a reality. You're my son, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was a son, it says. So it was thought of Joseph. And people say he was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. One of the greatest theologies in the Bible, friends, is a theology of adoption. And I want to say to you today, if you're watching this or listening to this podcast and you're adopted, I want to tell you that Jesus was adopted. And this is his adopted family that we're going to read about now. Verse 24, the son of Marth, the son of Metatius, the son of Simon, the son of Joseph, the son of Jodah, the son of Joanan, the son of Risa, and so on and so on and so on. This is a whole list of names that Troy, you mustn't give your boy when he's born, when you have a second child there, Amen. But let's carry on there, verse 37. The son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalil, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. Say the son of Adam. Good. The son of God. Turn to Joshua chapter 3 quickly with me. Turn it there. Put Joshua, Judges, Ruth in the Old Testament. Have a look there. Open it up on your little smartphone there quickly. Friends, we've got to study the Bible. We've got to look at why these things in the Bible all line up. I've had an incredible week just studying and going through it together. We're going to read it a couple of times. Remember, we said we're going to read Luke over and over until we fully understand it. Remember what it says there? It goes back all the way to... What? To Adam. Yeah. The first guy. Joshua chapter 3 and verse 14. Israelites are on their way to the promised land. So when the people, these are the Israelites, broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. This is an amazing story. Get this. Stay with me. Now the Jordan is in full flood. Pete's going to put a picture up for us on YouTube Sunday just showing you how scary this Jordan River is in full flood. The river's in flood during harvest, yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan, and as soon as their feet, yeah, as soon as their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. Listen, yeah, it piled up at a great distance away at a town called, see it in your Bible, say it, what does it say? Adam, proper Joe. In the vicinity of Zerathan, while the water flowing down to the sea of the Arabba, that's the Dead Sea, was completely, boom, cut off the river, full flood, right there. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Say that, dry ground. Man, hold on to that story and go to John chapter 10 with me in the New Testament. Jay was right eh, when she said you needed your Bible. So I hope you've got it because have a look at what happens in John chapter 10 verse 40. I'll wait while you turn there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, New Testament. This is incredible, guys. You've got to get this. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. So Jesus goes back across the Jordan at the exact same place where he got baptized. Incredible. Why does he do this? Yeah, he stayed 
At the place where he got baptized and many people came to him, they said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man is true. And in that place, say that place, in that place, many believed in Jesus. In Jesus. Which place? In that place. Which place? In that place where Jesus got baptized. In that place where he was called the son of God for the very first time. In that place, the same place where the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River. In that place, how amazing, many people believed. Incredible, eh? So as the priests stepped into the Jordan River, it backed up all the way back to where you said it. Backed up all the way to Adam. Jesus gets called the son of God. And in that place where I believe and where I accept that he is the son of God, my whole life gets changed. It's amazing. eh? And everything from my past gets backed up. And I'm no longer being swept away by the flood. I'm no longer being overwhelmed. Jesus makes it possible at that place for you and I to pass onto dry ground. Last week, Saturday, there was a man in our our church who went to the bunny park. Take your kids there, bud. They say it's quite lacquer. They did a revamp. Cost a lot of money. And so my mate, he's in our church. uh, his His name's Mike. I like to call him Mike. And the mechanic for Jesus. He's not really a mechanic, but it makes quite a Mark the, Mark the mechanic for Jesus. He goes to the bunny park with his daughter. And, and he, he meets a man there. He's never met this man before. But his daughter and this other man's daughter end up playing at the bunny park. And this man starts talking to Mike, the mechanic for Jesus. And this man says, I'm going through an incredibly painful divorce. And my daughter's taking big strain. And so Mike, the mechanic for Jesus, says to this guy, hey, tomorrow morning, there's some church that's meeting in some field, Brentwood Park, Venus Road. Just come, man, have a pancake there with me. And so this guy comes with his daughter on Sunday morning for the very first time. And, and, and right at the end, when, when everybody had gone, I meet this man, I walk him to his bucky with his little daughter. There's another story behind Sunday. A lady's name is Jenny in our church. She wants to make cupcakes and let Rudy and 313 just bless people with cupcakes. Jenny, this little girl was eating one of your cupcakes as I met her. But she folded back the wrapper, Jenny, of your cupcake. And she was licking this, what must have been an incredible cupcake girl. And I watched her look to me like she hadn't tasted or eaten a cupcake in in a long time. She was loving that thing, man. And and I started talking to this man and he told me his story and the pain that he's going through through this divorce and how it's affecting him and his daughter. He says to me, I want to come back. He says, I want my daughter to learn about the stories in the Bible. I thought, wow. Wow. If this man and his daughter do come back, and if they both listen to stories in the Bible, because that's what we want to preach about at Freedom, stories in the Bible that the Holy Spirit makes come alive to people. If they do come back, and if they do decide to give their lives to Jesus and believe in Jesus and believe that they too need to get baptized, and if they decide to follow Jesus, the one who was declared the Son of God, When he stepped into the waters of baptism. If they surrender their lives to Jesus at that point. At that place in their lives. They will be changed forever. And they will walk on dry ground. Because I believe that prophecies written in the Bible 700 years ago. Are applicable and very much meant for us at a time like this. In a city like ours. For that divorced man and his little girl at Freedom Church. And so when you study the bloodline of Jesus all the way back to Adam, it's one big story, and the hero is Jesus. And in that place where you make a decision to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, in that place you will get saved. 
And I pray that if we preach the Bible properly, many people will get saved. And he will take you onto dry ground. Smooth ground. No, no. Sometimes it's rough and uneven. But it's dry ground, friends. And he will take you into the promises that he has for you. For time's sake, I'm nearly done. Let's jump to Luke chapter 4. You've got your finger there with me. Troy, you got it there, but have a look there. Luke 4. Remember we're talking about prophecy, hey? Verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. They didn't praise the priests. They didn't praise the synagogue. They praised Jesus. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stands up. He stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet gets unrolled and handed to him. Remember this scroll written 700 years ago, hey? It's handed to him, unrolling it. He finds the place where it's written. The spirit of the Lord is on me. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Now, some of us have grown up in charismatic churches, eh? And you've checked those oaks. They get up and they change their voices like the Americans. The Spirit of the Lord is on. I've got a mate like that. He's been to an American Christian conference and he hoys a bit there. I don't think Jesus would have spoken like that, eh, babes? I think he would have spoken normally. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Spirit of the Lord's on me because he's anointed me to pro- proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. I had a look at the Greek meaning of that word oppressed. It's to change the status of people's lives. Amazing, eh? Disgraced, disillusioned, your status gets changed. To set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolls up the scroll. He gives it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. As he began saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What scripture is he talking about that's fulfilled? Let's go back to the Old Testament to find it. Isaiah 61, 700 years ago it's written. This is it. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and captives and release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then there's a line there, and the day of vengeance of our God. But when Jesus stood up in the synagogue that day, he didn't read that last line. He missed that out and he folded up the scroll and he gave it back. He stopped where it says at the year of the Lord's favor. Why? Because you know what, Freedom Church, we're not living under God's vengeance. We are living under God's favor. What's God's favor, people ask? His favor is that he's willing to accept sinful men. In other words, his favor is that he's willing to receive sinners for him, to him. Through saving grace. There will be a day of vengeance. Yes, there will. But that's a day in the future. Right now, we're living under God's favor. And we can read the book of Luke as a book of favor from God to his people. And when people come and they speak about the day of vengeance and they come with all that stuff. Yes, and the day of judgment. That's a day in the future. But right now is the day of the Lord's favor. Today is a day of forgiveness. Today's a day of salvation. And if we fully read and completely understand the book of Luke and the Bible, we will be able to tell our city and the people who live amongst us and that work with us, we will be able to tell them about our God who saves, about our God who is kind, and about our God who is gracious. We can believe the Bible. Why? Because of prophecies from 700 years ago that line up to the New Testament. Everything, friends, everything in the Bible lines up. And I sit with you tonight and I want to ask you with me, don't you want to make a decision 
to follow Jesus? Don't you want to make a decision to declare that he is the living God and the Lord of your life? Because if you do, and if you read God's word, just like my friend's wife reads God's word, you will walk as you believe and trust in God. You will walk on dry ground. Easy plain sailing? No. Sometimes life is tough, but you will walk on dry ground. I want to challenge each one of us. Let's build a Jesus, a Jesus church together with Mike, the mechanic for Jesus, and Jenny, the cupcake lady, so that we can show our city how they can live life to the full. To the full. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.